broad topic that is hard to be covered in, in 20 minutes uh, uh, talk. But uh, what, what I'll try to do is I'll try to uh, discuss the main motivations behind federated learning. And I'm going to have a narrow focus on, on uh, particular tasks which could benefit from federated learning in the context of MRI. So the, the outline of my talk is uh, first, I'm going to do the uh, focusing part. So I'm going to uh, describe which particular tasks uh, that, that, um, uh, that I'm going to describe in this talk. And as, as I work mostly on dance prediction tasks, this, these will be related to image formation, uh, for instance, reconstruction of accelerated acquisitions or translation between different MRI contrasts. And uh, I, I'm going to try to highlight why deep learning models are helpful for these tasks. Uh, and, and how do we train them? Uh, how do we uh, deal with them? Uh, of course, during this discussion, uh, we are going to have some uh, so, some highlight on the potential problems that arise in, in this domain. And, and the one that relates to the session regarding reproducibility is the issue of overfitting and, and generalization. Then uh, I, I'm going to talk about multi-institutional collaborations where you try to gather data from multiple sites and collaborate to train these models. And there are, uh, there's, there's both a classical paradigm of doing it and, and federated learning as a recent alternative. And I'm gonna try uh, end the talk with uh, discussing some example studies and, and the proposed methods for the, the dance prediction tasks that, that I introduced in the beginning of the talk. Of course, AI has broadly adopted in medical imaging over the recent years because we have many uh, tasks related to data processing in the classical medical imaging pipeline from how to collect data to how to form images and then extraction of intermediate features for quantification of some tissue properties down on to eventual diagnosis. And, and all of these stages and associated tasks have been shown to benefit from adoption of AI models over the recent years by many studies, and MRI is no exception. As I said, I'm going to primarily focus on low level or early stage tasks related to MRI in this talk. And uh, as with other modalities, when you focus on image formation, the tasks always, in a way, involve how to address the physical limitations of the modality. For MRI, a uh, primary limitation is that although it offers diagnostically rich and diverse contrast information from soft tissues in particular, it's an inherently slow imaging modality. This causes a disadvantage in, in practical use uh, because you know, it, it results in long exam durations, increased costs, and, and lowers patient throughput. And some patient populations may not be uh, uh, compatible with very long scans, like you know, elderly or pediatric populations. So it really harms the clinical utilization of MRI. To go about this problem, of course, you know, and, and this has been a long-standing problem in MRI tackled with many different approaches, but the common ingredient to various different uh, techniques is that if you want to go faster, you just need to reduce the number of samples you are about to collect in your experiment. So that will take your scan time down. But at the same time, it will introduce some negative implications depending on how you choose to reduce the number of samples if you are, for instance, uh, skipping some case-based lines in your acquisition, then you will introduce aliasing artifacts and noise, which will hamper the diagnostic uh, visibility of, of the image. Or if you don't want to touch case space, but if you want to select, you know, pick and choose between the contrasts in your protocol uh, to prioritize some more, more relevant ones and, and downplay, for example, a T2-weighted image, in this protocol, then you need to face some performance loss in downstream tasks, whether it's segmentation or, or diagnostic use. Regardless of how you choose to undersample the data, whether in case space or in the domain of sequences, uh, then you set up an inverse problem, which is uh, difficult, and because you start with, let's say, low quality data that is corrupted with artifacts, and you're trying to go back to high quality images or you start with data with missing entries in, in the multi-contrast protocol, and you're trying to impute this data and, and figure out how the anatomy would have looked like if you had the chance to collect all of the contrasts. And these inverse problems are difficult, and uh, deep learning models are particularly good at solution of inverse problems, so it's no surprise that, that they have been met with 
um, you know, increasing interest in, in MRI tasks. In the context of MRI image formation, you could take uh, a neural network model, for instance, to implement the reconstruction task and figure out the nonlinear transformation from under sampled acquisitions provided as input. And, and you can try to clean those images to provide outputs that will be consistent or as consistent as possible with fully sampled acquisitions. Or in the case of contrast translation, you could try to feed acquired source contrast images of an anatomy and ask the neural network to learn the nonlinear transformation that would predict what the same anatomy would look like if you had the chance to collect a target contrast sequence on, on, on that subject. And both problems, of course, can be dealt with deep learning models, but we need some basic ingredients. The first of which is because deep learning models are intrinsically data driven, we need a relatively sizable data set of sample data on which we are supposed to be performing the training of these models. In some cases, there may be public data sets for your use, but as your application gets more and more specific, it will become increasingly more difficult to compile this. But let's say you somehow gathered your hands on some data, then you need to pick your neural network architecture. Of course, there are a zoo of architectures out there by, by, by this state. And, and starting with relatively simple ones that start off at tens of millions of parameters, the recent trend is to go for even more and more complex models with the recent you know, transformer-based architectures exceeding over 100 million parameters. And depending on your application, you may want to opt for one or the other. Let's say you have selected the architecture. Now is the time to perform the actual modeling. So we have uh, our data set. We need to split it into a training and validation set at the very least. And the, the training set is usually the larger one among the two. And on these images with, uh, in a supervised setup, the, the, the corrupted images as input and the high quality images at the output side, you try to figure out the unknown parameters of the model by going through these samples. Once the model is trained, you need to validate it uh, because we want to make sure that the model will function as intended when it's eventually deployed for uh, on, on other new subjects that, that may come in. And uh, you know, validation uh, partly addresses this problem, but at the same time, uh, tracking validation scores is very critical because this is where big problems can arise in deep learning. And they arise because we are coupling very, very complex models with limited data. If you think about it, we have tens of millions of parameters on the left side with the models, but we have maybe at best hundreds or, or in some cases thousands of subjects. Uh, so th th there's a large mismatch in, in uh, the, the, the degrees of uh, model parameters versus the subjects you're trying to train these models on. What that causes is in the loss versus model complexity length landscape, although you can take your training loss uh, down to even zero as you increase the degrees of freedom that your model has, what happens in that, in that regime is that with over complex models, the, the, the model will start memorizing the nuisance trends in the training data set. So it will not be able to generalize to new uh, independent subjects. So the, the generalization loss or the validation performance is going to go down. And this is a well-known problem in statistics and dates, uh, you know, predates back uh, before the deep learning era. And there are classical approaches that are uh, that have been proposed and used over the years to deal with this, with, with this problem. Uh, you know, some of these techniques will involve cross-validation, uh, as, as I discussed, splitting of the data into a training and validation set, or regularization or data augmentation uh, procedures. And, and while they are definitely useful, these are indirect approaches that sort of try to hide the problem under the carpet, because they won't actually allow you to fit the model in all of its complexity, but they will try to automatically and gracefully restrict the degrees of the problem that uh, the, the, the model that you use. So while you're thinking, you're, you're, you're trying to, and uh, working with a 100 million parameter model, intrinsically down inside, these procedures will cap off the complexity of the model so that overfitting does not come to rise. So they are not the real solution to this problem. The actual solution, of course, is to expand and diversify your training set. So the model will get the chance to see many different anatomies or physiologies in different subject cohorts. But this is 
This can be immensely difficult to do if you are, you know, let's say, an independent research lab trying to operate on your own resources. But it can also be difficult uh, in, in individual sites because uh, a specific site will have access to a certain type of scanner or scanner family. They have certain brands or hardware characteristics. They may ru be running or accustomed to using certain types of protocols. And they may have access to some local uh, patient populations that manifest certain types of properties and not others. So it's, it's very difficult to uh, diversify data sets if you are uh, operating solo. What you can do is, as a natural solution to this problem, try to collaborate between multiple different sites. In this case, the data collection problem is, is uh, easier on each site because now we are combining powers. But at the same time, because we will have access to different scanners, uh, different protocols, and different patient cohorts, we are satisfying the diversity condition in an intrinsic way without trying to stretch ourselves. Uh, the classical approach to this problem that, that we have been running, uh, as you can see from the public data set that we compile for these purposes, is that each site does its own, own, own task of collecting some sizable portion of data, and then the sites come together, they transfer their data sets to a central repository. Uh, and then once the data set is aggregated in this repository, the modeling phase can start. So we have access to this really large diverse data set. So the model that you train will be more generalizable as a result. But there are problems in this type of centralized approach in that you need to transfer imaging data that's sensitive and that can contain patient-specific data in it, even though uh, you, you try to anonymize it to your best. And uh, so, so you introduce patient privacy risk when you transfer this data across institutions or between the repository and the institutions. And furthermore, to set up such a large-scale collaboration, there are many ethical and legal regula regulations because transfer of imaging data is involved. So this can be quite uh, uh, both bureaucratic and, and uh, practical burden on the individual sites. Federated learning is uh, an alternative paradigm that, that uh, enables a shift from data sharing to sharing of models to help reduce the privacy risks and also to uh, reduce the bureaucratic burden because now uh, we are making a claim that we don't need to transfer imaging data, so the risks are lower, so we can be uh, maybe a bit more lenient on establishing collaborations. How federated learning works is we have a centralized FL server, uh, or, or I should say this is just one model or, or one uh, structure for federated lear learning. There are alternative architectures, but you know, th this is uh, a good uh, point uh, to start the discussion. So we have a centralized FL server, which keeps a global model that we eventually want to obtain. Uh, this is the generalizable model that will have seen all of the training data from the sites. And at the beginning of training, this global model is communicated to individual sites by the server, and they create local copies of this model. Afterwards, using their own local data and own computing resources, the sites keep updating this local model uh, for the task at hand. And uh, so th this continues for some many local training epochs. After a point, once the sites think that there's a sufficiently significant update, they resend their updated versions onto the server. So these uh, dashed lines, the, these boxes, represent the local copies sent from the individual sites. And the server now looks at these models and uses some kind of aggregation algorithm that requires no access to data typically. And then uh, the, the models are averaged or aggregated down onto a global version. And this process, this communication round is repeated many, many times until a convergent or desirable solution is, is achieved. The, the benefit in doing the, the model training this way with model transfers as opposed to imaging data is it facilitates collaboration because we don't have to uh, send sensitive imaging data across sites each time so that the communication load is reduced. Uh, it also reduces privacy risks because we send a very, uh, if you will, uh, hidden nonlinear transformed version of the imaging data when you ship off the, the, the uh, models themselves. 
uh, as opposed to the imaging data. And it's not that easy to tie the model parameters to the images of individual subjects. That's, that's why uh, we, we argue for this approach. And uh, at the same time, uh, so the, the modeling workload is also distributed to individual sites. So we don't model all of the data in a centralized fashion with immense resources, but we do it locally in smaller bunches. And as a result, uh, due to the multi-site nature and diversity of the data, if you're able to do this successfully, uh, federated learning promises both high-performing and generalizable models. But that latter promise, whether it actually capitalizes or not, depends on a, a critical factor that, that ties also to reproducibility um, in, in the broader sense. The, the idea in establishing a multi-site collaboration is that we get exposed to anatomical and physiological variability across different patient cohorts. So what you would have ideally desired is that there are multiple different sites and their patient populations have different anatomies, physiologies, and the model has a chance to see all of those uh, to benefit from, from the diversity so it becomes more generalizable. But in practice, what happens is there is undesirable or nuisance variability due to technical factors that causes dis disruptions or domain shifts in the voxel intensity distributions that don't really have anything to do with the underlying physiology or the anatomy, but that are driven by two factors. I, I categorize them under implicit factors. And these can be related to hardware-related parameters. You can have, let's say, different scanner brands or different field strengths that cause these type of intensity distribution changes. And there could be sequence parameters tied to the hardware restraints that you, you don't really have much control over. On the other side, there are user controlled explicit factors. Uh, for example, if we are collaborating on an MRI reconstruction task, uh, each site may choose to work with different sampling densities or acceleration rates. Uh, each site may have slightly different contrast selections in their multi-contrast protocol. And these user controlled factors will also cause changes uh, or domain shifts in the voxel intensity distributions that are not related to anatomy, but that will nonetheless affect model performance. So unless you separate the nuisance variability and have a way to cope with it in your model, uh, besides the, uh, the anatomical variability, the performance will inevitably go down. And that's why we have you know, data harmonization methods at play in many quantitative imaging studies in MRI. So how do we deal with this in the context of federated learning? There are a class or, or subclass of methods in federated learning known as personalized FL techniques. And I'm going to try to highlight uh, personalized FL at play by discussing two studies, one of which is on the MRI reconstruction task. The other will be on the contrast translation task. For uh, federated MRI reconstruction, the, the method that I'm going to discuss is a recent one from our lab, which is uh, FedGIMP, uh, a multi-site model based on generative image priors. The idea here is we built a GAN model uh, collaboratively across multiple sites, but this is an unconditional GAN architecture. So its inputs are noise variables and it synthesizes realistic looking MR images. So this kind of uh, unconditional modeling, what it does is it tries to capture the distribution of MRI data in individual sites accurately. Once you train your image prior, uh, and you know, uh, I should mention that this prior knows nothing about the sampling densities, coil sensitivities, how we undersample case space. And this is intentional because we don't want the model uh, to constrain the acceleration rates to be fixed across sites or sampling densities. In this setup, each site can freely choose what acceleration rate they, they desire, how they are going to undersample their data, their data eventually. But of course, now we have a generative prior that doesn't receive as input undersampled acquisitions and doesn't really know how to reconstruct it. So we need a specialized test time adaptation procedure. The way to go around it is we basically have this model synthesize a fake image from a synthetic subject. And we want to align this image with the undersampled data from an actual subject that has been measured. To do this, we project the synthetic image onto individual coils using coil sensitivities estimated from a calibration region from, from the measurements. And then we subject it to the undersampling mask of 
prescribed in the subject, now you have a multi-coil undersampled image that has been synthesized by our model, and we can compare this to the measurement to define a reconstruction loss. We minimize this reconstruction loss to update the parameters of the model, and at the end of this process, the, the image synthesized by the, the network will be aligned to our measurements, so we can call it our reconstruction. Uh, I'm highlighting here a visual result at 6x acceleration. The, uh, the, the R approach is highlighted here, which yields results very close to the reference. And to the left of it, you see federated learning approaches that are based on conditional architectures. Uh, they, these are baseline models, state of the art from the literature. What they do is they are, they are explicitly informed about the undersampling pattern during training. So if you try to change from variable density to uniform density sampling at test time, they start failing drastically because the, the aliasing artifacts they learn during training are, are appearing very differently at test time. And this type of performance differences uh, are also reflected in quantitative metrics, regardless of whether you assume within domain uh, experiments or cross domain experiments, uh, meaning whether you assume training and testing cases had matched sampling density and acceleration rate or whether they were different. The second example that I'm going to highlight, which will be the last one, is on uh, contrast translation in a multi-site setup. So here uh, I'm going to highlight a conditional GAN architecture, which receives as input source contrast acquisitions that have been acquired, acquired and it's the, the model is trying to guess what the same monotopy would look like in the unacquired target contrast. And uh, we are allowing, in terms of flexibility, each individual site to prescribe different type of translation tasks that might be required because, uh, for instance, they, they, they choose to work with different protocols or there may be patients who uh, moved un undesirably much in, during the collection of a protocol. So in each site, the, the missing or, or the corrupted contrast might be defined differently. To cope with the intensity distribution differences and different tasks across sites, what we do is we take a ResNet model as our generator, but we inject it with these personalization blocks in between each layer. What they do is they modulate the feature map mean and variance, and they play with the channel weights in a site and task specific manner, so as to cope with the heterogeneity in the data in a meaningful way. And once you do that, you can see that th this is our approach and these are competing methods and this is the ground truth uh, reference image for the target contrast. You get be better and, and closer results to the reference compared to non-personalized approaches. And again, in, in most quantitative metrics and in most tasks, the, 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 the benefits are apparent. Now, in these examples, I mostly focused on federated learning results and comparison to baselines, but I want to go back and, and uh, reinstantiate the fact that the, the federated learning setup actually fulfills its promise and it, it can beat single site models trained independently per, uh, per individual research, researchers in a site. So if you take our, for example, reconstruction model trained across four sites, and compare it to the same model trained locally in an individual site, you can see that it actually gives performance benefits. And these are uh, expected to grow larger as you have a site with limited local data or limited diversity in its data. The second promise of federated learning that it, it can uh, improve perform uh, performance, but at the same time, privacy. And personalization mechanisms are particularly useful in this regard. So we have unshared discriminators in GAN model that are kept private. The server never sees it. We have feature map modulations and weightings in the generators, again, kept private from the server and other sites. And we don't share all of our network layers with the, uh, the server, but only the downstream layers are shared in a partial network aggregation approach. And all of these, uh, the, these items actually reduce the risk of information leakage while you're transferring models. And on the left, you see the uh, layer-wise information leakage probabilities across the generator. And you can see with each item introduced regarding personalization, we take down this probability from the brown bar down onto the green bars. And with that, I, I would like to you know, summarize the, the discussion. So federated learning enables privacy-preserving pres collaborative AI by avoiding data transfer 
but instead communicating models or bits of these models. Uh, and because these models actually get a chance to see data from multiple different sites, they, they promise being more reproducible. Personalized FL methods as a subclass of FL uh, can improve reliability against undesirable heterogeneities that naturally exist in multi-site data. Uh, and, and by undesirable, I mean the cross-site technical var variations that have nothing to do with subject anatomy, but that arise from you know, hardware or software related choices in individual sites. And uh, finally, uh, although I had time to discuss only image formation tasks that relate to dance prediction in, in MRI in this talk, there are many other uses of these models in downstream tasks such as segmentation and classification. With that, I would like to conclude the talk and thank you for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shukur. Um, I guess we can, uh, while we wait for Peter, we can do some questions. So I see, uh, Mo, you have a question on hardware architecture. You want to ask it yourself? Uh, yes, uh, really great talk. And uh, you already know that I'm really interested in this topic. Uh, so, uh, I was wondering, uh, so there are differences in different, uh, in across different sites, uh, in terms of, uh, the hardware that they use. And, uh, first of all, did, did I understand correctly that the different sites train the model collectively? Is it, is my interpretation correct? Or is it trained on a central site, but getting data from different sites? So uh, if you're doing centralized learning, then you get the data uh, accumulated before training starts and uh, how you have a central computing service on which you can do the, 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 the modeling. But for federated learning, each site takes a, a, a local copy of a global model and performs local training okay, with yep. no respect for the data from other sites. And they ship off the, the local copy down to the server when the training is done. So it's done, it can be done synchronously across sites, or it's possible that they do their training on their own uh, timeline. But uh, in a way, they, they try to do this in a concerted way to, to harmonize uh, the, the modeling updates. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, uh, does the models that are trained on different GPUs, for example, or different GPU families, be consistent to each other? Or could it be a There are no constraints on which framework you're going to use or which GPU architecture, as long as it fits in. Uh, the, the idea is you are only going to ship off the model way. So as long as you ship them off in a compatible format, uh, it doesn't really matter what you do locally. So th there, there are no constraints in that regard. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, may I ask, uh, while I'm, <laughs> I, I have the chance to be here, uh so uh the other question that i have is regarding the data leak that you said uh so you mentioned the probability of leak that is lower or higher in, uh between different uh, architectures so uh how easy or how probable is it to to uh, identify subjects from the trained models so is, is, is that at, at, at all possible or so if if you're sharing the discriminators in gan models uh, then it's really uh, uh, easy to identify uh, by, by probing into this model which uh, of the subjects have been included as, uh, as, as training subjects in the set. So they are very amenable to these kind of membership inference attacks. So that's part of the reason we keep them local because they are vulnerable, but on the generators that have in only indirect access to training data through the discriminator, it's more difficult. So uh, you know, studies show that you almost have a 50% chance of guessing whether a subject was in a training or not if you were looking at generator weights. So it's not that easy to do this kind of attack. And if you are talking about trying to reconstruct uh, images of training subjects, that's you know, very, very difficult yeah. to do. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh... I guess we can continue. So now we have uh, Dr. Peter Larson from UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, who will be talking about designing AI-based methods for reproducibility. 
that is yours, Peter. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good morning, evening, afternoon, middle of the night, uh, depending on where you are here. <clears throat> Let me get my going here. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Tolga, for that, that great talk uh, leading us off. And um, and I'll actually <clears throat> try to tie this together uh, at the end. I'm, I'm really was really interested to hear um, <clears throat> what's, uh, what you're doing with federated learning. And, and I think there's a, a huge potential um, there as well. So um, I'm going to. Um, uh, and I also want to say thank you to the organizers. Uh, this this uh, really cool, uh, innovative event. Um, OK, so um, I want to, uh, um, let's see, um, give some I, uh, general, I would say, or a, a range of thoughts on kind of reproducible um, AI methods. Um, you know, the, the first question I'll just kind of throw out there is, is reproducibility can mean a, a lot of uh, different things. Uh, I'm just going to you know talk about generally things that I think are somewhat reproducible or generalizable. Um, but there's a lot of uh, way to look um, at the problem and, and where the problem, I think, of reproducibility in AI is going to come up, um, you know. Uh, does it mean you have to work on, you know, what, how, how uh, generalizable, right? Different data across institutions, or is it reproducibility in how our techniques work, right? Does we need to be able to create the same uh, training result, uh, create the same uh, inference result, uh, number of things here. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have a lot more to say about data, except that I think maybe this is kind of the obvious one here of that. You know, Data is uh, incredibly important for the reproducibility problem. Um, but then um, I think uh, uh, methods wise, there's a few things we can do um, to improve reproducibility and some things I think actually the community is doing uh, already. Um, and maybe just to add uh, to what you heard uh, in, in, in Tolga's talk um, is that, um, and, and I think this is important to think about when, as a community, uh, we're thinking what makes MRI different or unique from, you know, generally from computer vision, but maybe from other medical imaging. Um, and we have both this uh, 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 feature and problem of the flexibility of MRI, which is, of course, is what makes it great, but also is going to make uh, makes things like. Um, harmonization, reproducible imaging, just inherently challenging. We know this already from, from a lot of other research on non-AI related uh, in terms of trying to unify and harmonize uh, MRI protocols, do quantitative imaging, for example. Um, and uh, there's going to be, um, you know, even within my institution, the way a certain contrast is run might vary from one scanner to the next because of maybe because of just how it was set up, the preference of the uh, radiologist uh, at the time, for example, um, in, in our, you know, little things, echo times, echo train lengths, whatever that may be. There's, there's so many parameters we can tune. Um, and then, uh, of course, a lot of literature out there on the differences between vendors, between software versions, and I think uh, again, an area of both uh, uh, the power of MRI, but also a challenge for reproducible methods is that, you know, the, we're continuously trying to make the acquisition or the uh, methods uh, better and even the reconstructions, but that's going to lead to things like data set uh, uh, shift and when we're trying to do data-driven methods. Um, so uh, the first uh, type of approach that I think, uh, fortunately, if you jump to the bottom, that, that actually we're 
I think as a community are doing very well, uh, is, is looking at uh, physics-based uh, AI methods. So um, we, we know we have a good, pretty good physical models for much of the MRI systems. So why go fully data-driven if we can somehow bring in that uh, prior uh, physical knowledge into the methods? Um, and you know, of course, uh, the stakes are high for a lot of the things uh, that, that we do, uh, medical imaging and uh, hallucination, overfitting images to a population model. Uh, we need to be very aware that this is uh, uh, not just the image doesn't look good. This has downstream consequences. <clears throat> um, and so I would argue, I think that our methods will be more reproducible if uh, somehow we include uh, information about the known physics rather than uh, just data. And and I think the, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the MRI research community has already developed and readily adopted a lot of physics-based AI methods. Um, you know, the contrast <clears throat> to physics-based methods would be, you know, something like this, the vanilla uh, UNET approach to undersampled uh, uh, reconstruction um, this taken from the uh, fast MRI um, challenge. Um, and there's some, maybe some, uh, you know, technical issues here. Uh, for example, it's uh, thinking about the receptive field of the model is not going to be very good for a uh, uh, reconstructing um, <clears throat> uh, missing case space samples, which have, of course, uh, receptive field is the whole image um, and parallel imaging. But uh, fundamentally, this is not. Uh, uh, these are not physics-based approaches uh, or model-free approaches. And, and here's uh, uh, an example uh, from the ISMRM workshop data sampling work, um, image reconstruction workshop, excuse me, um, where they took a, a, a model-free reconstruction, something like the one shown at the bottom, and just fully data-driven, uh, you know, and, and it can lead to this uh, overfitting to the data that has been seen and so can cause problems for, for unseen pathologies if uh, particularly when we push the acceleration factors. Um, and the, the basis of a lot of the physics-based uh, AI methods in MRI reconstruction are based on algorithm unrolling, um, so taking gradient descent, ADMM, uh, and, and looking at them as an unrolled uh, uh, unrolled process uh, where you have uh, neural networks and weights you have to learn um, through, uh, th uh, through data and training. Um, just a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a great review here at the bottom of algorithm unrolling. Um, and so, um, you know, so a lot of the uh, variational networks are unrolled uh, image reconstruction models are based on this principle, um, nicely illustrated here at the right, where we have uh, multiple stages of the reconstruction, and each one um, includes a term uh, that's, uh, that is basically a DNN-based regularizer. So that's where trying to learn uh, you know, the features of and correlations of the anatomy, uh, of the data, the contrast. Um, but then having this uh, a data consistency block where, for example, might include uh, uh, the, the physics of uh, coil sensitivity maps and, and, um, or just uh, uh, minimizing the chance of hallucinations because you're doing these updates based on a, a data consistency term, whether as opposed to letting the, the model kind of uh, run wild. Um, and you know the MO uh, DL model based reconstruction using deep learned priors is, is inspired by the ADMM optimizer approach, um, and this is one of the methods you know, might consider state of the art, <coughs> um, and uh, has the same uh, principle of and it's, it's really I think comes down to the the data consistency uh, term and and uh, but also. Uh, um, the fact that we're maybe leaning back on on optimization theory uh, as well, um, and of course we see that, that these uh, unrolled networks, like variational or MODL, um, are going to uh, 
give really really state of the art uh, results. Now, um, this is um, you know, th this is not the uh, end all solution. I think there there can be still a, a, a data set uh, shifts. Uh, this is an example from from work from uh, Florian Noll, I believe. Um, we're going to high acceleration factors. Um, if you're training on uh, one anatomy versus another anatomy, um, then uh, you can um, even in a, a physics-based uh, model lead to sort of artifacts and, and additional uh, hallucinations. Um, and I think um, you know, to me, kind of open question of of we have these changes in our acquisition that, that we're going to have because uh, we want to improve the other things, our coils, acquisition schemes, et cetera. How much new data do we need there? Um, all right. Um, then I'm going to switch gears here uh, to, to think about and, and uh, show you some example of ways we can begin to uh, assess confidence of our AI methods. And so um, just to be explicit, the idea would be, well, well how can we have some, some better uh, confidence uh, in what the model is outputting? Uh, I think if they're, we're looking at image-based uh, image methods, we're creating an image as an output, like reconstruction, um, even segmentation, um, we'd want to have uh, ideally some voxel-wise sort of uh, confidence guess there um, for classification uh, tasks um, you, know, uh, you can maybe have a more of a, a, a single metric um, potentially um, and uh, the perspective I would look at this from is that you can think of like a lot of what a, a when when you are a radiologist or somebody's looking at an image with conventional methods we have sort of known ways that noise propagates and art artifacts form in the image. And so as users, we are learning, um, we have a confidence when we see an image, right? If we see artifacts, we see higher noise levels, and that's gonna degrade our confidence. <clears throat> um, and I think uh, as we uh, reduce the noise, as we get rid of some of these, these artifacts and, and really uh, fit heavily to data-driven uh, models, <clears throat> is this uh, is this way of developing confidence, this visual sort of artifacts or noise uh, going to remain? Um, okay, and so one example uh, I could show is is from uh, uh, and, and we can think generally or maybe Bayesian methods, uh, statistical methods, uh, where um, might be able to give us some additional insight. <clears throat> um, and so I have an example here from the problem of synthetic CT, which has a few of these applications, converting MRI to synthetic CT for PET MRI, MR-guided focused ultrasound, radiotherapy planning problems. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is sort of set up as, as almost a, I'd say almost a worst case uh, scenario, looking at some of the challenges here of, of we're going to have motion artifacts, implant artifacts. Uh, uh, bowel air, uh, we might have limited training data or even uh, MRI and CT. It's not going to be perfect. We have mismatch between these. Um, and uh, so in this use case, I uh, 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 had a, a talented previous student who, who identified an approach called Monte Carlo dropout Bayesian CNNs um, to generate this confidence. <clears throat> um, and uh, the idea behind there is pretty simple, um, that uh, add some uh, stochastic uh, dropout during training and actually train an ensemble of models. And then you can get some, some uh, probabilistic variations in the output. And uh, here's my picture of how this works. So what is showing in the middle here is that instead of now training a single model, you'd actually train uh, some ensemble uh, of models. Uh, with uh, they will have slight variations uh, due to the due to dropout, and then on inference you're going to run through this ensemble of models, uh, and and you could do more complex statistical things, but simply you could create a mean 
which is is presumably the average guess the average guess of these different models and then a variance and um this should capture some amount of the uh model uncertainty or the the model confidence um at least probably relative to what the the, the model has seen uh, before or the quality of data that it's seen before um so uh, uh, the setup of this case was, was actually again kind of uh, extremely challenging to you know, trained on matched MRI CT uh, of patients without uh, hip implants, and then you see signal dropout uh, artifacts from patients with hip implants, and see what happens. And um, and you know first, if we do this pseudo or synthetic CT estimate. Uh, we see these uh, kind of black holes, which you might expect. Well, it looks like a region of no signal, so maybe there's no CT. Uh, in fact, um, these implants are, are the opposite. They're like the, almost the worst case scenario in that regard, and that they have very high uh, photon attenuation. And then what you see if you run this ensemble models, keep the standard deviation, is you see some some interesting patterns. Notably, first it it identifies well this uh, 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 signal, uh, large signal void of the shape is, is something that, that, uh, the model is very, uh, uh, has very little confidence in is one feature. And, and then we see some other interesting features here of actually, you can see the bony anatomy well-defined and this is well, what we might expect of, uh, if we have no signal in the bone. And so, um, the, uh, the uh, we might expect the model to have just less information there from MRI to be able to do this MRI to CT. So in some ways we have here now a, a confidence of, of the model in, in what it's um, creating. Um, and I have a few other examples. This was kind of a lot of fun to to play with. Uh, so uh, Dixon MRI uh, inputs on the top. Uh, the mean uh, synthetic CT variance and the actual CT on the bottom here. Um, and you can see this type of approach will pick up uh, uh, artifacts. So there's a motion uh, uh, artifact <coughs> that gets nicely uh, uh, picked up here. Um, now in this training data, there's a, a difference here in that the, the CTs are all arms up. So there's no arms in the image. MRI is all arms down. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the model is trying to extrapolate and, and develop a signal from the arms, but uh, it shows high variance in the arms. There, we're not included uh, in the training data. Uh, again, more another example here with, with stronger uh, motion artifacts, uh, these issues of bowel air. Can you say this one? And, and then this was another uh, you know, interesting uh, part here where actually oops, um, the, uh, the, when the image was, was created and output it, it was truncated the legs as we got further down in the field of view. The model you know, actually tries to fill this area in based on what it knows, but tells you with the, the Bayesian approach, well, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm trying, but I'm not very sure about what I'm doing. If I can. <laughs> Be colloquial about it. Um, and then in, in this case, this is uh, uh, there's some uh, way to actually incorporate this information into the PET uh, reconstruction by having a, an MR prior penalty here, where we actually can uh, input this uh, confidence map and, and ask the PET data, uh, time of flight PET data, to fill in some of this additional information. Um, and so here, uh, also arguably, this is kind of a physics-based where uh, approach where we use the AI on the front end to to derive the uh, you know some version of the attenuation information, and then we're like actually going back to a more physics-based uh, reconstruction of the PET data. Um, and you know, the punchline here is this, yeah, kind of works um, pretty well. Um, the, uh, briefly another, um, work that, that I came across, uh, recently, 
um, was something called uh, a drift detection <laughs> um, uh, tackled by a group at Microsoft and, and Stanford. Um, and um, this example is in chest X-ray, but I think it's really uh, uh, an interesting example of how this might work generally. Um, so the idea here was to, to come up with some drift metric that would capture whether the AI model that you have is still applicable to data that's coming in, so new data. <clears throat> um, and what they did, and, and I apologize, it's a little small, but I'll give you the high level, is they tried to compute some metric based on, on actually the images coming into the model, uh, other metadata, and, and then the, uh, the outputs of the model as well, combine this into a, a single uh, metric uh, that would hopefully capture you know, things like data set uh, a shift um, using uh, or, or uh, using data that might not be appropriate, could be you know instrument uh, changes, things like that. Um, and what I want to highlight a little bit of, of sort of a possibility that they do here, uh, and I've seen some other sort of investigation of this is um, you know use it. Uh, to actually look at uh, uh, the feature encoding space uh, of a neural network uh, and use that to kind of identify out of distribution um, data. Um, and uh, um, uh, you could probably do this in a, in a number of different ways. Another way to think about this would be to look at, uh, say, the feature encoding space and maybe do some um, you know, try to come up with uh, uh, some sort of clustering or or within that feature space um, a manifold that you ex you know that you're, you expect data to live on for for being sort of in distribution um, and this is not easy with with imaging you know high dimensional imaging data um, and then maybe you could you could get a get a sense from you know, from either from a, a this case a a, a uh, trained uh, autoencoder or maybe even from the AI model itself. <clears throat> um, you can look at this feature encoding um, space. Um, and so I think there's some interesting ideas, possibilities there. Um, the, uh, this was an example from, from this work uh, in chest X-ray where they, the model was trained on adults. They introduced uh, uh, pediatric uh, uh, data and uh, their metric here, the red, curve of their metric kind of drops way off as soon as they begin uh, trying to evaluate the model <clears throat> on pediatric data as opposed to intended adult data. And so you know, presumably this would be a way you could kind of flag, um, uh, tell somebody, hey, you need to stop using this model. It's not uh, performing as intended now. And, that, and I think we probably in MRI are going to have a lot of issues going forward with, with data set shift. Um, so tools like this could be interesting. Um, and I'm going to wrap up uh, with a, another uh, a brief plug for, for uh, federated uh, learning. Uh, I think I've also heard it called distributed learning. Um, if uh, you're just joining, I'll give you the, the quick overview, <coughs> which is that uh, uh, basically data can be maintained within uh, individual sites, um, training done on an individual sites, and then there's some server it's going to do some kind of uh, aggregation of the training results <clears throat> uh, to generate a, a model that um, you know leverages uh, now hopefully larger and more diverse uh, data sets uh, to improve the output. Um, and uh, I think as uh, uh, Olga mentioned, uh, Atolga mentioned. Um, you know, I think this is especially valuable for, for some academic uh, uh, research, which I think academic research is kind of inherently distributed, right? That's where we're all trying to get together at these conferences. That's where we're trying to do more open science. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, in healthcare, where the sensitivity and hurdles to sharing data are just uh, higher um, than maybe in, in other fields. Um, um, so I think there's a there's a huge potential here, um, and there's uh, um, 
you know, I think there are uh, open challenges into uh, into the uh, these processes are a little less mature as to how to set these up. Uh, in in some investigation that that, that I've been involved with, um, the tools that are available, you know, weren't weren't always okay. Um, for especially for uh, you know less uh, kind of standard models or or training strategies and the other thing that um, um, we might uh, we found that was really valuable and a practically was to to set up some local um, simulation protocol we called FL sim um, to to actually simulate the federated loop locally before kind of deploying into a full uh, uh, federated uh, setting where it's it's a little harder to, to control all the pieces uh, that is going on. Um, and uh, uh, this is an example from two uh, universities. Um, and I think what you can um, you know, actually uh, pretty well appreciate from these these images is, you know, when um, it's actually going to have quite a bit of, I think this is going to be an open challenge. And like I told you, I was talking about some methods here um, of e even we're, we're doing a relative, the standard prostate MRI kind of protocol here of T2 weighted imaging and diff diffusion uh, weighted imaging. Uh, you can see that the, 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 uh, the image uh, outputs here, um, are uh, quite um, different between our two sites. You know, I mean, there's even some some cropping things, but the uh, um, some normalization <coughs> um, uh, uh, differences, uh, characteristics of noise, uh, and even the annotations that we had available were different between the different sites. Um, and uh, so this is probably an open. Uh, uh, challenge with uh, federated learning, um, but uh, what you can see in, in sort of the uh, top right and the bottom left corner of this uh, this plot here um, is that uh, we get huge improvements in generalization uh, when going to this in this little simple uh, two-site uh, federated learning. Um, you know, but there is uh, some loss of of performance probably because when you look at a single site um, and and probably uh, some of this is due to the the data set shift or the the heterogeneity between um, the two sites um, so um, you know um, there's uh, some a lot of potential uh, so certainly some challenges uh, to work out there as well <clears throat> um, all right so uh you know my final thoughts again, um, there's a lot of ways I think we can think about and need to think about what it means to be uh, uh, reproducible. Um, and I think uh, all these things are important. Uh, you know, generalizability of AI uh, is, is massive uh, uh, open question and is, is going to be very important uh, uh, going forward. Um, a few of the ideas that I've seen that I like are the physics-based uh, models, uh, or Bayesian-based uh, uh, methods to and uh, to look at the confidence, for example, of of model outputs. Um, this idea of maybe drift detection, and then uh, again to to Tolga's talk of the federated learning, I think is is a very exciting um, area, um, and. You know, I think this this uh, area of reproducible and generalizable AI um, is going to be extremely valuable uh, going forward. Um, great, thank you for for your time. Thank you so much, Peter, for your great talk. Uh, we'll have some discussion now, so I invite you to ask any questions you have on the question box. Um, any questions for Peter or Tolga? Um, So we have a question from Mo. Uh, you want to ask it yourself, or you want me to read it?
Uh, yeah, another question from me. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it seems that uh, it's a magic solution to generalizability in AI, but uh, what do you think, I mean, both, both of you uh, are the main hurdles in this take up and uh, what should be done for it to be the main and uh, the major uh, method of training AI models going uh, to the, in, into the future? Or even would it ever, uh, you think, be a, 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 a method that could be used uh, broadly in the future? So for federated learning right now? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe you can speak to this totally too. But, uh, um, it's, uh, there, there is a lot of, um, There, there does need to be a big sort of um, harmonization or standardization. Or, uh, I'm not sure I have the right term, but they, that goes into this because it's not like as a single site, we can kind of do just the things things the way we want, right? We can, okay, we choose uh, how we're going to do our uh, annotations, how we're going to store our data. Um, I think annotations are actually, you know, a big one, but even, even pre-processing. Uh, of data if that's involved um and uh you know now, now you have to come together and and really agree on as a, or in within the federated learning kind of consortium how you're going to um uh, do this i mean uh, uh, um, i think there may be other um methods that will will kind of you know get around that but i think that's one and then um the uh you, you the you know when, when other people think about federated learning they think about like we're not talking two or ten we're talking like thousands of of kind of sites and and uh it's probably not you know uh that would be a lot for for for, for mri um but i think in the at least the way i've seen a lot of the current implementations is they do require to get an individual site requires a lot of expertise at that site. And so how do you make it something that's a little more um, uh, push button almost from an individual site to get uh, set up and get into a federation or get into a group is um, a technical challenge, I think. Thank you. Um, I guess I had a question. Uh... Peter, so for the MRI to CT mapping, you, you show you you can bring some uncertainty. Um, were you able to show any kind of guarantees on the certainty, like probabilistic guarantees, or or is it more like validation by, I guess, looking at the images and and I guess verifying that we actually are uncertain in the areas that we're having are making mistakes. Um, it's, sorry, can you say that again? You're, how to how to validate the uncertainty? Is that what you? Yeah, I guess you, you predict some uncertainty with the Bayesian network. Um, are there ways to I guess quantify this, maybe in a probabilist, probabilistic way that you have looked at or you have thought of, or I guess what do you think will be some requirements needed if we want to deploy this at some point? Um. Yeah, I think uh, uh, so. In the example that <clears throat> that I showed, um, there, uh, uh, um, the kind of the the scaling of those probabilistic outputs was kind of arbitrary, and so I went through some some process to. Uh, and based on the downstream task of the, the pet reconstruction, went through some some process of like, well, how do we how do we normalize and kind of interpret those outputs uh, in that way? Um, um, you know, I think you could set up uh, uh, probably experiments where, I mean, in that case, you didn't have ground truth, but where you did have maybe you, your highest quality or, or some higher quality ground truth and look at um, um, 
you know, for example, in a parallel imaging problem, like we could compare with something like a G factor map might be the, the equivalent uncertainty, <coughs> um, conventional method. And, and so maybe there's cases where you could look at something like that, uh, as kind of a, a validation, um, and, uh, uh, didn't show, but like looking at, um, the same type of methods in more of the image reconstruction context. That's that's the type of pattern you would see was like a uh, both a, a noise uh, and uh, G factor type maps. Yeah, those methods. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have a question from Nico. You wanna ask it yourself? You're welcome to. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the fabulous talk so far. Um, yeah, I'm very new to the AI space, so I had some sort of general questions. So for, for Tolga, um, what are the biggest challenges for federated learning in multi-contrast MRI? And can you see federated learning being used in perfusion-weighted imaging, for example? Um, so, so I think uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges for uh, federated learning in general is data heterogeneity. Um, as, as I mentioned, there are multiple sources of it. Uh, so the, the clients or, or the individual sites may have static uh, differences regarding, you know, scanner hardware software, but they could also drift across time. So it may be difficult. You may also have to keep track of it. So I think that's a fundamental problem. And regarding you know, perfusion weighted imaging, I, I think if the sequence that you're talking about is more sensitive to these types of scanner differences, you know, sequence parameters, then it will become more difficult to cope with that variability compared to something that may be more standardized, like an MPRH sequence that more or less yields consistent images. So um, in my view, um, so, so either incorporation of some domain adaptation procedures with uh, small amounts of fine tuning data or personalized FL approaches are needed you know, to, to address that challenge. Great, that thanks. Thank you for the question and the answer. Um, I guess I have one question. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with differential privacy, but are you aware of work into that federally learning, I guess, with MRI data, that is sensitive data has we seen work on differential privacy being introduced in the training of models. I know that performance is hurt when we add differential privacy, but um, I don't know if you see any any thoughts on that. Yeah. Either Tolga or, or Peter. Yeah. I I haven't seen any uh, uh, talks on it, but it it uh, every time I've had details conversations about federated learning, it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah and i think there's there's different ways you can kind of do uh trust models um and and uh, as well i think we need to think about who are the participants in the the federation too um, um yeah but i haven't seen any work 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 in that area um but it, it will it will i think <clears throat> this if this grows it'll it'll um become uh, probably something we want to use I guess for my, what I've worked with it is like you need even more data because uh, the performance degrades and so on. So, but yeah, probably at some point. Uh, we have another general question um, for both of you. What are you the most excited to see in the next in the AI space? Um, I mean, I, I mean, per personally, I think one remaining problem of deep learning models, we have seen that they enable performance leaps in many different modalities tasks is their, uh, you know, uh, interpretability. So, you know, when things fail, you know, how do we figure out which component has led to the failure? That's a big uh, thing issue. And some of the methods Peter outlined, like uh, with the uncertainty estimates, uh, I guess are going to be helpful in that regard once they become standardized. Um, and, and the other thing is, um, I, 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 I kind of believe in this federated learning setup taking over the you know, independent model building uh, over the long run, but I'm not sure whether the models should be you know, these big sites 
uh, joining in in a collaborative training, whether it should be at the device level in a more swarm or edge learning setup that, that might be more continual and better distributed. So that, that's something I think that will uh, eventually have to be figured out in the long run. So that might be an exciting uh, development. Awesome. Okay, uh, I guess, go ahead, Peter. Um, I, I, I think, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree with with yeah that that is area of excitement. Um, I think um, <clears throat> you know something that I think is coming along is is also um, you know just more less MRI technique and maybe more operational, but like the the automate uh, um, AI methods for automating uh, or even uh, uh, which which would lead to maybe better standardization of of just how they, the the data is acquired on the front end, right? Either the, the operations that scanner operator uh, are are performing, um, you know, maybe some uh, opportunities for um, data quality control, just as as the scanner is being uh, run, um, is is seems like kind of. Actually, relatively low-hanging fruit for 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 AI, but could improve um, the use of MRI a lot in research. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll close this discussion, and we actually have another speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Ipong Ip Yang from the Martinez Center for Biomedical Imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. We'll be talking about uh, his work on structural imaging features at multiple scales to study neurodegenerative diseases. That is yours, Ikon. Uh, All uh, right. Uh, thanks. Uh, am I sharing the correct screen? Yeah, we can see it and hear. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is Ikon Jing. Uh, I'm going to talk about like. Uh, uh, less deep learning style uh, and more conventional machine learning in analysis style uh, study, where we uh, looked at structural imaging features at multiple scales to study neurodegenerative diseases. And in this uh, talk, I'm going to talk about an application to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so uh, first things first, uh, let me give a brief background of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, our recent biological framework of Alzheimer's disease emphasizes three types of uh, pathology to characterize Alzheimer's disease, uh, amyloid, uh, tau, and neurodegeneration status. Uh, amyloid and tau are abnormal proteins in the brain. These are normal proteins accumulate in specific parts of the brain uh, that support memory and many other cognitive functions uh, in the patients. These, uh, uh, these pathologies begin a decade or more prior to the time when clinical symptoms are apparent. That's, uh, that has been a, a problem uh, for many years. And the third component, which is uh, neurodegeneration, is typically defined by atrophy um, or morphometry uh, measures derived from structural MRI. Uh, the commonly used ones are hippocamp hippocampal volume and cortical thickness. So as you can see from the figure on the right-hand side, uh, so healthy brain has uh, thicker uh, cortical tissues, uh, whereas uh, the patients with Alzheimer's disease have very strained, uh, uh, thinned, uh, thinned cortex. And also, if you look at the, the volume of the hippocampus, it shrinks down uh, rapidly. Um, so, so we just talked about the cortical morphometry, uh, or such as hippocampal volume and cortical thickness. So, so those are. The, the key measures that are being used in clinics recently to diagnose uh, Alzheimer's disease when MRI is used. 
but is cortical morphine actually all we have from structural MRI, such as telomerated MRI? Um, and, and, and my answer is that we can also use intensity profiles. Um, so, we, so we propose to quantify mm -hmm. imaging features at both uh, microstructural, such as uh, morphometry, and a microstructural level. Uh, from a single telomerated MRI. So microstructural uh, scale features such as uh, tissue properties obtained from multiple layers of cortex and why matter. Um, we, we in, so in this uh, application, we aim to enhance the ability to detect uh, neurodegeneration as well as neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is uh, all about uh, developing and defining our imaging markers. Uh, and, okay, here we go. So structural scale feature, and we call it GWR. Uh, I'll explain it more uh, below. So structural scale feature map generation is uh, described here in the slides. So we first, mm, so, so we expanded, expanded the intensity or Contrast metrics to include tissue sampling uh, from from okay, from multiple points through the thickness of the cortical ribbon and subjects and white matter to obtain an array of intensity linked features. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the, if the image in the right hand side is big enough, but uh, you can see we have like uh, several layers of white matter or WM, and, or, and we also have several layers of gray matter, uh, or GM, um, throughout the cortex. And the, the red color, red surface, represents the white surface, uh, which is the boundary between gray matter and white matter. And, uh, and the white is the peel surface, which is the uh, boundary between gray matter and CSF. Uh, and so we, we so the intensity ratio between okay, before before doing that so specifically cre we create a set of surfaces in Y matter sampled at 0.5 and one millimeter uh, subjacent to a uh, gray matter Y matter border and also we we extract four surface layers um, in the gray matter. So we have uh, like four gray matter surfaces, surface layers, and white matter, two white matter layers. We create ratios of each pairs of surfaces, which give us eight contrast features at each cortical surface of vertex. Um, so the the rationale for computing this ratio or or gray to white matter contrast is that. Uh, Gray matter and white matter intensities from from neighboring neighboring voxels or, or vertices are expected to be similarly influenced by imaging parameters and protocols or, or imaging sites, whatever. Therefore, getting this ratio between white matter values and the corresponding gray matter values provide a relatively normalized unit across different imaging environments. So this is uh, the whole rationale of doing this. Because we we all know that different MRI, different imaging device can result in different type of images. Different uh, MRI manufacturers have diff provides different images, even if uh, even if even for the same anatomy, same subject, or same participant. Um, therefore, getting some some normalized uh, property uh, out of different or various Imaging devices is very important. Um, so uh, this uh, this this flow chart contains a lot of information, but uh, I'll, I'll focus on some important stuff. So step A, we do a lot of image processing, uh, primarily using a free surfer toolbox. Um, we we, uh, we do the segmentation um, and. Cortical mapping, um, then 
after that, we get tissue properties from multiple layers of gray matter and white matter as discussed in the previous slide. Then we compute gray matter to white matter tissue contrast at, at, at each vertex or each, each for, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, vertex is the correct word. And so this is what we call the uh, relatively microstructural scale level features. And, and we combine that with more conventional uh, feature to compute cortical morphometry. And here we use cortical thickness across the, across the cerebral cortex. Um, and then, I mean, of course, we can use all, all these features together. But what, what, we, what we do here is uh, doing the imaginality reduction using a vertex-wise uh, partial least squares uh, discriminant analysis. Um, so that we get a single single feature value per vertex. And then we do classifications. We train multiple machine learning models um, to, to do classification uh, tasks, um, such as uh, differentiating Alzheimer's disease patients from controls or, um, or detecting uh, patients with uh, mild cognitive impairment who will develop Alzheimer's disease in the next five years, or even uh, detecting normal, like cognitively normal individuals who have amyloid pathology in the brain. So, uh, so models such as uh, random forest neural networks, um, super vector machines are all trained uh, separately. And then we choose uh, five best models to, to ensemble then we test on the held out uh, test set and also show statistical analysis. Um, so uh, here's uh, the figure shows the effects of Alzheimer's on, the, on our feature called MSSM and also on the conventional cortical thickness using gender statistical contrast. Um, so left is the proposed method and right is the conventional method. So use of the MSSM features double the number of uh, number of vertices showing a statistical difference between Alzheimer's patients and cognitively intact uh, controls compared to additional uh, cortical thickness measures, uh, demonstrating the increased sensitivity of the MSSM metric. So re regions, brain regions most affected are those known to show early and aggressive degeneration from pathology studies. Um, however, MSSM additionally highlighted later stage regions in the frontal cortex. Um, so yeah, and by the way, so when, when we do the when we do this uh, group level analysis, we we match group for their age, sex, and education because uh, those factors are really important in in aging and Alzheimer's uh, studies. Um, and, and also, we use this, the same procedure, MSSM procedure, uh, to see effects of uh, global amyloid beta positivity uh, on MSSM and cortical thickness using standard uh, statistical contra contrast. Um, as you can see here, MSSM features exhibited significant group differences between uh, amyloid, uh, pathology, amyloid pathology positive and amyloid pathology negative groups, while uh, traditional cortical thickness, thickness alone did not show difference in the same sample. Um, it's yeah, it's noteworthy to see the widespread effects uh, found in MSSM across the posterior temporal and parietal as well as medial prefrontal cortex, uh, which is uh, very consistent with the localization of amyloid pass signal, which means that um, so we we only gave the model the global positivity of amyloid uh, pathology. And the group level analysis show, show that, show the information that PASCAN used to give. That's, uh, that's the important um, takeaway from here. Um, so these are some classification studies uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, so when we want to detect uh, Alzheimer's patients from, uh, from matched controls, uh, we were able to achieve AURC of 96%, AUPRC of 97 or 8%. Um, 
Um, and there we had a second task to detect amyloid positivity. Uh, and this is within cognitively healthy controls. Um, so meaning that this is a much harder task because no one has any uh, outstanding symptoms or no one in, in this cohort had any uh, diagnosis before for MCI or Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we compare our method to the commonly used uh, structural features, such as the temporal volume and vertical thickness. Um, and the MFSM achieves uh, greater uh, performance in terms of uh, ARC, APRC, and, uh, as well as precision. Um, yeah, and, and these, uh, there are several uh, cognitive score based models uh, and this is not yeah this is to make sure that uh, it is the, the two groups we are differentiating or classifying have very similar cognitive performance as when we train with these cognitive uh, composite scores the model was unable to uh, efficiently distinguish the two groups um, so here's a Summary. I mean, I I'm not like I haven't presented all the all the details, but um, hopefully that was uh, there was something important uh, takeaways. So first of all, uh, advanced structural mapping can detect tissue changes earlier than the assumed time frame. Uh, so early detection or diagnosis is very important in Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative disease because when when they have symptoms it's very late especially for alzheimer's pathology begins 10 years or more before they show symptoms so we we all aim to detect those uh, pathologies or, or early uh, signals before something came up before symptoms came up uh, the proposed MSSM procedure can be used to complement uh, cortical thickness. And these preliminary results suggest that we can identify alternative thesis atrophy signatures and neuropathology in non-clinical, asymptomatic, non-diagnosed uh, younger individuals. Um, this, this study cohort uh, used three MR manufacturers, uh, all uh, G, all three uh, major ones, G, Simmons, and Phillips, and and the imaging imaging data were acquired from more than fifty imaging sites. So the method shows generalizability uh, across uh, many different environments. However, um, substantial validation of the diagnostic framework is still required on more diverse racial groups um, and on on more diverse uh, databases, uh, completely different databases. Racial groups uh, uh, diversity is very, very important because most of the public data we have, uh, I mean, they are very they are large, uh, hundreds of data. However, uh, the important thing is that uh, they consist mostly of uh, like white uh, white uh, population. Therefore, validation on uh, minor uh, ethnicity race is very important. Uh, I'll wrap up here and I. Acknowledge to all my collaborators, uh, PI and, and the, the NIH who funded the project. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ikpom. Um, we have some time for questions and discussions. Um, so please put your questions in the question window and about questions. And yeah, we can have discussion with everyone. Or yeah, yeah sounds time. good. Do you think you might have the best and say something else? I guess we can start with uh, Ikpo, uh question from the last session. What are you most excited about? in the AI space upcoming.
I cut. Uh, sorry, I cut off for a sec. Uh, yeah, I guess. What are you most excited uh, coming up forward in the AI space? Uh, I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, uh, I think the most most uh, exciting thing about AI is, I mean, not just you know, specific to me uh, medical area, but also in in all the areas, including NLP, computer vision, self driving, everything. It's, I think it's growing really fast because a lot of things are open sourced and people are even sharing the, the precious data they have collected for years. Uh, they have coded for years. Uh, so yeah, leveraging all together, it's growing really quick. I was amazed recently by the, the chat GPT, by OpenAI, for example. I mean, amazingly good and also for, yeah, in the medical domain, uh, federated learning is a is a very important area because you know it is uh, growing area because of security and privacy issues and uh, so I think I think the I, mean, I don't I don't I'm not saying that AI is everything in, of research uh, everything of technology. However, I would say that uh, making making your research open and widely accessible is the key to uh, the success of the field. Um, and that's what I'm most excited about. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Nico. You wanna ask it yourself? Sure, I can do. Hi, Iqbal. Um, so my question was, uh, towards the end of your talk, you raised the issue of bias um, based on ethnicity in AI models. Um, I was wondering, one of the main solutions that gets proposed is using more diverse training data sets, but are there any other solutions um, to this sort of... Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great and big question, I would say. Uh, so some of, some of the, I mean, there's some of the uh, approaches in, in in terms of uh, machine learning techniques, for example, uh, if we want to be uh, more, we want to focus on more equity uh, uh, across uh, diff like diverse races, for example, there's a way to uh, give different weights in training. For example, like if you have very, very little data uh, uh, for, for Asian population or, or, or black population, for example, you you you're able to give a greater weight on on those samples when training the network or or even other models. So that's one way of uh, like going around, one way of like work work around about bias uh, or or uh, non evenly distributed uh, racial population. But I mean, I would still say if you have very little samples in specific. Uh, racial groups, I would still be interested in getting more data in those uh, minor population. Uh, but doesn't mean that we have nothing to do, but yeah, I think the data is the most important thing in the end. Thank you. I guess I have a general question on re, uh, like time to having open source code and everything. Uh, tied up to reproducibility, reproducibility. So I guess usually one of the main constraints is the data. So I guess federated learning comes here because allows uh, us to like access the data without really accessing it. But um, how do you see this? I guess in general in the in the space um, on how do we actually share? I guess we start with some baseline, right? And uh, and some other researcher wants to work on top of this, right? How do you see this uh, federal learning being able to be shared in some way, but so all the researchers can build on top of it? And anyone on the stage, I guess. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think in, in maybe more on the, the front end of things. Um, I think it's it's both for good uh, to is to have the um, you know, the the <clears throat> methods that are being uh, uh, used uh, uh, sort of 
by the by the central server like in in, in federated learning to be um to be open and available to you know uh, anybody who's participating in, in these or wants to uh take advantage of that um um and i think i mean it'll be kind of you know maybe with a slight balance of <clears throat> having something on the side to to preserve you know, privacy preserving um if uh, if you want to be aware of attacks um um but i think uh in the process of doing federated learning i think about how we can uh, make make the um uh, being part of it uh more more accessible um and and i think that could be um lowering barriers for for kind of the uh uh technical know-how provided for example um would be helpful um yeah and then i don't um i think it's an interesting question how do you how do you build on top of it because uh like that i think the structure we see in now is okay everybody gets together and you kind of build the you know do some round of rounds of, of training and you build a model and then you know maybe people go their separate ways or right does this does this uh, federation as i call it disintegrate uh, uh but if you want to come back and make improvements to that uh um but you you could maybe you know you could certainly do it by taking some of the model off to a single site but then how do you preserve the uh the uh the the high generalizability say of of what was created by the federation and build on top of that i think with, without you have to get everybody kind of back together or, or how that can be balanced i don't know you know maybe there's some ways that the server can can have some uh um Think of the history of what was done in the training of the model, such that um, you're you're almost adding in a, a, a new set of data, but considering like okay, what was the what were the uh, the the changes in the weights in prior rounds of of the training? You know, might might be a way to kind of um, bound somebody coming in on top of what was already done. Thank you. I guess we have another question. Um, another general question for the panel. Anything that stood out to you from each other's presentations that you, you would want to implement on your own work? Hopefully. <laughs> I uh um yeah I think some of the things that that uh, uh Toga showed about about thinking about um uh, how to maybe unify data from from different sites and um um uh, is something I uh, definitely want to take a closer look at um see how to do Any other questions? Okay, great. I think we can uh, close the discussion. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining. I'd like to thank the organizing organizers for organizing this. Uh, it's been great. I look forward to the next sessions and learn more about, uh, I guess, how data is being used for MRI domain. And uh, once again, thank you to everyone. Uh, this is recorded, so it'll be accessible for everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.